DG Robin, DG N3 Glennis, GMT National Coordinator Anne, Leos, Lions Partners and Guests, Conventioneers all. Our keynote speaker today is Dr Gregory Smith, who has the most interesting life story to tell on how to, think, how to turn things around. Having had all odds stacked against him from the start, through experiencing abuse and neglect, and being surrendered to an orphanage in the 60s, this led to a life fighting against the system. Drug and alcohol abuse, addiction, homelessness and disparagement from society. Being completely at odds with the world, he walked into a northern New South Wales rainforest where he stayed for 10 years. How he left the forest being seriously ill, still haunted by his personal demons, and then gaining a PhD, became a university lecturer and an ambassador for Australia's forgotten children, is a testimony to his tenacity in not giving up. Dr Smith now lectures at the Southern Cross University and is a regular speaker and presenter. He's appeared several times on Australian Story and ABC Conversations. District Governor Robin Parker will conduct his presentation in the form of an interview. I'd like you to welcome Dr Gregory Smith, please. Welcome, Gregory. Can people hit back down the back here? No. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Down the back, all right? Yep. Welcome, Gregory. When I first spoke with Gregory, he said, do you have a theme? I said, yes, it's change. He said, that's the same as mine. So looking at this world we live in, we have to embrace change, otherwise we get left behind. And Gregory's story will tell you all about his change. I'm going to read to you an excerpt from the prologue of his book, Out of the Forest, a fascinating read. I've read it three times. I've lived his life. I've cried with him. It's an extraordinary story. And this is a quote from the prologue. I woke up on my back with a large snake on my chest. Surely it was going to sink its fangs into my throat and leave me to die in the ferns and the dirt. I'd slept in enough roadside ditches to know I shared Australia with an all-star cast of nasties, not least taipans and eastern brown snakes. They're pretty much a slithering death sentence, especially if you have the misfortune of walking, waking alone in the forest with one on top of you. I can't say that life flashed before my eyes that night as I lay there frozen. But even if it had, I probably would have looked away. Such was the waste it had been. One thing was certain though, I wasn't ready to die. Gregory, let's go back to your childhood, up to the age of about nine. Could you tell us about your family? Uh, I was born in Tamworth, New South Wales. Uh, we lived, well, my parents at the time lived in a... Can you hear me now? Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was born in uh, Tamworth, New South Wales, uh, a little house in Darling Street. Um, across the road, uh, my grandfather had a shop and up on the sign it had Orb Smith for everything um, and he did mean everything. Um, everything from chicken feed to the, anything on the black market that you needed. He was an entrepreneur and uh, I eventually learnt my entrepreneurial skills from him. But uh, my father was a very traumatised person and it's very important for me to say that because it's too easy just to say he was an alcoholic and um, uh, a perpetrator of domestic violence. Yeah, um, 
we all have reasons for the way we are and he had his reasons but he was very nasty, he was always drunk and um, there was a lot of violence in the, in the house that I was born into. Uh, I was a brother to four sisters uh, by the time I was ten. So what was life really like at home? Terrifying, scary. Um, one, of the, one of the skills that I learned early was to be able to walk into a room, be super vigilant, know which windows were open, know if there was any obstacles in the direction so that I could make a quick escape. Um, quick exits were really important in my life, as were learning not to be too obvious. The problem was that um, when my mother would antagonise my... I mean, my father would sit drunk and generally just be angry and drunk. Um, my mother would antagonise him and that would create... Uh, the conflict, the violence, the friction. And over the years I developed a habit of standing between them because I wanted to rescue. I, wanted to, I didn't like what was going on. I, I wanted to rescue my mother. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand the danger of what was happening. About the age of two, a little, just around about the age of two, um, my father picked me up by the leg and flung me up against the wall of the family home. Um, and I did quite a bit of damage to my, my, uh, my head and my hearing. I'm, I'm, de I'm very hard of hearing. I'm not completely deaf, but I'm very hard of hearing to this day uh, just from that incident. But you also tried to protect your mother and your sisters. I did, yeah. Um, Whenever there was conflict, uh, I would always put myself uh, in, in the way of that conflict to try and divert uh, my sisters. I, I mean, my sisters were very important to me. I had, as I said, I had four sisters, four siblings at the time, and they were the only source of comfort to me. Um, they were the only people that understood what was happening in my life. And I understood what was happening in their life. Uh, and we protected each other as best we could. You know, and it was, um, it was a horrible life. But to be fair, we didn't understand that at the time. It was the only life we had. So we, didn't un we had no benchmark by which to measure a good life or a bad life. That was our life. Let's go to the age of when you were 10 and your mother took you to see Auntie Muriel. Who or what was Auntie Muriel? Yeah, that was a, an exciting day in the life of a 10-year-old. Um, I got home from school and Mum announced that we were going, the next day we were going to go up and visit Aunt, Auntie Muriel in Armadale. And... Um, Oh, it was a really excite, really exciting time. Uh, I didn't know much about Auntie Muriel. Um, my sisters were coming as well, so we were going to go on this long car trip. It's a long trip. Oh, well, it was a long trip then from Tamworth to Armadale, about 60 miles, I think, in an old FB Holden. Um, no, was it F no, it was an old Walsley, actually. Um, So we all pile into the car on this day and we head up to Armadale to see Auntie Muriel and as we pull in I'm thinking, wow, Auntie Muriel's got a really nice place. It's big. It's really big. There's lots of doors and lots of statues, lots of crosses on the wall and lots of stairs going up to this big archway of doors. Anyway, Mum pulled up um, at the bottom of the driveway and these ladies dressed in black and white attire came walking out and I'm thinking, wow, Auntie Muriel's kind of... She's very different. 
And by the time they got down to the car, um, these people, uh, obviously nuns, so I didn't know that at the time, um, were kind of roughly encouraging us to get out of the car and move on up to the stairs and I didn't understand what was going on. I had no idea what was going on. And I was, I was getting afraid but in that fear there was that, that want to strike out, you know, to protect my sisters, to protect what was going on, not to let this happen to me. And we were kind of really coerced up the stairs and then when we went through the archway doors, I had to go to the left and my sisters had to go to the right. And that's the first time I really, a, a different reality struck me because I didn't want to be separated from the only real people my, yeah, my, my kin, my family. But Auntie Muriel was actually what? A nun. And uh, I, there was an Auntie Muriel, but we weren't at Auntie Muriel's place. But yeah. the actual building was? Uh, St Patrick's Orphanage. Yeah, that was at St Patrick's Orphanage. Um, yeah, so... Tell us about your life there, the food, the clothing, the religious immersion and how you reacted. Okay, yeah, leading into that, there's a couple of things. Um, that, that era, you know, children were seen and not heard. And nobody told me, nobody took the time to explain to me what was going on. So I was left in my own confusion. And, I, and that confusion became anger over time. And... Like, you know, like a young, angry ten-year-old, I, I, got, I, I really did lash out. But at the same time, I didn't like what was going on to me either, uh, what was happening to me either. Um, they took all my clothes away and gave me some old, second-hand, very shabby, uncolourful uniformy type clothes that I didn't, uh, they're not mine, I don't want to wear these. Yeah. Um, the food, uh, it was very bland, would be kind. Um, in the morning we would have porridge and there were weevils in it. And if you complained, you would, you would get a backhander, you would get hit. There was no mucking around. The, the, the Sisters of Mercy did not muck around. Yep. They, um, I guess with that many kids that they, under their care, they needed to be quite strict. Uh, and I think they had a lot of practice of it, at it because they were very good at being strict. Um, each morning when we got out of bed, um, there were a few kids that wet the bed uh, and they were shamed. Um, every morning they were shamed. They had to, while everybody was standing next, to, all the boys were standing next to the bed, they had to carry their sheets out and put them into a pile. And one of the nurses would be telling, you know, saying to them, you know, how lazy they were. They couldn't get up through the night. And, um, and you could see the boys were shaking. They were just afraid and lonely. And this was the life. And then as we walked out of the dormitory each morning to go down to Mass, one of the sisters would stand at the door and give us a couple of cuts across the back of the legs with a, with a cane. And she would say, that's for all the sins that you're going to commit today. And so that became an ingrained part. I expected that every day. You know, and if you do that to a child every day, that becomes a part of the psyche. Um, then we'd go down to mass and then there'd be a one hour mass before breakfast. And that was very hard. It was very hard to do. 
uh, on an empty stomach. Um, and then I could never understand why the nuns would sit up on this stage and eat their meals. And they already always had really nice meals. Really nice, like for breakfast they would have bacon and eggs and toast. Well, we ate our porridge with weevils in it. Every Saturday morning um, there would be one boiled lolly on the table in front of the nuns. And the castor oil was passed around. We all had to had a little thing of castor oil and whoever drank the castor oil first got the boiled lolly. Um, I can guarantee, yeah, the, um, the table where I sat was very well oiled uh, and it's probably still in good condition today. We'll move on, Gregory. And at 12 years old you were collected from Auntie Muriel's so-called so place. But when you went home, you went to high school and you started running away. I, I actually started running away in the orphanages, in the orphanage. Um, I was there for about three months in the orphanage and then I decided I didn't want to be there. So I started running away on the weekend, um, only to be picked up by the constabulary on a regular basis and told what an ingrate I was. Um, and they would often give me a hiding in the back of the police car before they dropped me back off to the nuns. Um, I often found myself locked in the closet under the stairs for hours and hours, sometimes a day or maybe two days. Um, but when my mother came and picked me up, um, I was very angry with her. I was very angry with her and that anger just didn't go away because she came and picked me up. That didn't fix anything. That just made things worse because we went back to the exact same violent situation. And so, and I didn't want to be there anymore, so I kept running away. Um, and like any child at that age, you know, if you spend that much time trying to escape trying to run away, eventually you do something wrong, yeah. And you ended up in a juvenile detention centre. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I ended up in state care. I became a state ward um, <laughs> uh, at the Queen's pleasure, it was called, um, at the time. <laughs> I'm a Republican, sorry guys. <laughs> Uh, but I'm always open to good conversation. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, the institutions at the time um, were different. Well, actually, probably not a lot different to the institutions today for boys. I mean, I spent a lot of time fighting. I was an angry, mean, skinny kid. And I was smart enough not to stand there and allow somebody to uh, intimidate me or anything. So I was quite an aggressive and preemptive sort of a kid. So, you know, rather than hang around and be teased, once I went to an institution, I'd sit there, I'd pick, you know, I'd, I'd work out who was the dominant dog in the, f and then I'd just walk up and headbutt them in the face. And then when they dropped to the ground, I'd just start kicking them. Yeah, just establish that don't muck around with me. I'm not in the mood. I don't want to be mucked around with. And something I should have mentioned a bit earlier. With all of this going on, the, to quote, I knew something they didn't. I had a fire inside me that burned somewhere. Keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think... Well, I'd like to think a lot of us can identify with that, you know, when we're that, when we're that child and we have that passion. We have that passion for life. You know, when I grow up, I want to do this or when I grow up, I want to be that. You know, and it's that, that will to live, that desire. And I, I, could, I could identify that when I was young. When I was laying in my bed as a kid, you know, and I'd circle the blankets into a circle, and they're fine. And um, 
and I'd, I'd be in the middle of that circle and that would be my protection. Nobody could cross over that and I would sit there and I would allow myself to dream. What was that dream? Different days, different dreams. But there was um, something special. Yeah. Um, I, I would dream that one day my name would be painted on the top of the of the um, buildings like my grandfather's, Orb Smith for everything, you know? And, and I had that, just that passion that I was going to be successful. I was going to be a successful person. I was going to have a good life. But the other, on the other side of that, there was another dream as well. And it was this great big ball that was rolling and it was always just, you know, just about to catch me. And no matter how fast I, could, I ran, it was always just right there behind me. Sounds like a nightmare. Uh, nightmares are worse. Okay, you've left school, we'll move on a bit, and you're looking for work and you're going up and down the coast. You end up in Bowen on a fishing trawler. Can you tell us about that and what you were thinking about yourself and other people? Yeah, that was a... I was in a pub up there, I kind of frequented pubs a lot. But why? Well, yeah, well, apart from the obvious, um, I liked alcohol, I liked the fight, and um, it was a good place to find, find work in those days. You know, you could go into a pub and have the conversations and end up with, and I ended up with this, um, this job on a prawn trawler with this big Maori, a Maori guy, he was, he was a big, a big man and um, he, you know, we got on really good. You know, I didn't, uh, he was one of those straight shooting guys, you could tell you a lot to him and he didn't judge you. Yeah. And he just accepted things as they, as they were. He asked me if I'd like a bit of work as a decky, and I said, yeah, sure. I had no idea what a decky was. Um, but I was about to be introduced to a new experience for sure. This guy um, would drink a bottle of Bum Bundy rum for breakfast in the morning. But the difference between he and I is that it didn't make, it didn't change who he was necessarily. It pacified him a little bit. If I had drank you know, a couple of mouthfuls or I might just be angry and want to fight someone. You know, but, and that always impressed me that he could drink so much rum. But one night it was, um, we were doing a shoot and a, a massive big storm came up. And it was, you know, there were pretty big waves. I, I won't pretend that I can um, measure the waves, but... Uh, anyway, he said, you know, bring the balances of this, the, t the balances that you have out on the arms. Yeah, he said, we need to get those in. So anyway, one of them we got in really easy and the other one got stuck. It was the right one. Got stuck. We couldn't bring it in. He looked at me with a big grin on his face and he said, one of us are going to have to shimmy out on that arm and, uh, uh, and unfoul that balancer and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, wow, you're going to have a... And then he handed me the rope to tie around me waist. <laughs> yeah, and he was very kind. He helped me tie the knot so it wouldn't come undone, you yeah? know. So in this massive big storm, I'm shimming out on the, on, a, on one of the sway bars, I'm not sure what you call them these days, but to unfoul this balancer. Anyway, I got back in. I, it was a really scary time, but um, it was a good trip. I I did good, and I got paid a fair. I got paid a fair price for that. Yeah, and you were a good worker. But what were you thinking? What did they really think? What yeah, did you think? Yeah, look, I didn't drink when I went out. Something like that. I wouldn't drink. And I wouldn't drink because I used to think, and it's the same everywhere, it was the same everywhere at the time, you know. I had such a low opinion of myself, I had such low esteem of myself, and I was the only person that truly knew my record. 
my history. And I used to think, you don't want to know me. You don't want to be a friend of me. You don't want to get to know who I am. If you get to know who I am, you won't like me. You won't like me because I don't like me. And I spent a lot of my life, most of my life, like that. So life went on and eventually you weren't working, you were drinking, you'd been to an asylum and then you crawled away from Tamworth and into the gallows of an uncertain future. What were you thinking then? I was thinking... You were homeless. Yeah, I was homeless again. Um, Look, I was thinking there's no hope. You know, I just can't do it. I keep trying, you know, uh, and I had this this cycle where I would break myself down to nothing. You know, I would drink myself into a, into a mess, into a wreck. And then the pain would become so, so much that I would stop and I would try to rebuild. I'd give it another go, you know. Uh, in, when I was in Tamworth that last time, I, you know, I, again, entrepreneurial skills, you know, I started a little cleaning business and I, I signed a, you know, I had a few contracts with the Tamworth Arcade and a couple of the pubs where I, you know, I had a few people working for me. So it's not as if I couldn't do it, but I couldn't do it because I could never finish because I was always there. And the one thing I didn't want in my life is to be wherever I was. I always wanted to be somewhere else, never where I was. So you continued roaming and then you ended up in Sydney and decided to go to TAFE. Now, I don't know why you decided to go to TAFE. It was in Ultimo and you had to do some written work. What were the comments made about your writing? There were several negative and one really positive thing. What was it? Yeah. um, The negative ones first. Oh, yeah, well... um, I can't remember what you were writing about, but the comments yeah, the, were... I, I'm just going into the essay. The essay was about feral cats and the damage feral cats were doing to, um, to our wildlife. And, I mean, even way back then, I was aware of what was going on. Um, you know, I, because I spent most of, my to- most of my time looking away from people. So... If I'm looking away from people, I'm usually looking into the into the forest or into the bush, or I'm seeing other things. Yeah, you know, I just didn't want to know people. But a lot of people thought I was a nutter. Uh, a lot of people thought I was an idiot, and um, you know, like I should spend my time writing about better things. Um, but there was one particular um, TAFE lecturer who picked up. Because at this time I was doing cocaine, marijuana and bourbon. So it was a pretty good mix. And sort of, you know, most of the time it got, got me to where I wanted to be was... And the place I wanted to be was where I didn't know who I was anymore. But I, there was what this particular um, lecturer and he, he looked at me. He knew I, he knew I was in trouble. Yeah, but he looked at me and he said to me, uh, Gregory, no matter what you do, don't give up on the idea of study. Yeah. So you were 35 years on this planet and what did you own? What did you have? Uh, at the age of 35, I was doing okay at 35 actually. I owned an Akubra, a dry as a bone and a backpack. And then you fled to the forest. Yeah. How did you get there or how did you live? Okay, yeah, there's a... Uh, um, sometimes people ask me why did I decide to go and live in a forest? And the truth of that is I never made that decision. What happened was um, I was walking the roads and I got to a T intersection I just left Mullumbimby and I walked up towards um, Gunningary 
at the top of Gurningarry. There's a T intersection, and if you look out to the right, it says Mill Road. It's just a little dirt road that goes kind of nowhere. And there's another sign that says um, Pacific Highway 13. And I thought, well, I know what's down there, but I've never been up Mill Road. So I made a decision to go up Mill Road. And um, by later in that afternoon, I, was in, I found myself sitting in a forest. And it was pouring rain. And I got my dry as a bone out and I put it out, covered myself because it was raining so heavy. And then it really started to rain. And so you lived on booze, drugs, a handful of nuts and all sorts of creepy crawlies, whatever you could eat. But how were you feeling? You were away from everything. Just how were you feeling then? Um, there was just a little bit of, like, in those first few days, there was just a little bit of calmness in, you know, that came into me. A little bit of fear had left me. A little bit of the dread had left. Because I've been kicked out of a lot of places. You know, you go to sleep in a park at night time and you got some security guard come up and kick you in the ribs, tell you to move on call you all the names under the sun, spit on you. Um, up there, there was no one to do that. There was, and there was no one to move me on, there was no one to yell at me, there was no one that I could look at and feel ashamed, there was no stigma, and I could just be. And I didn't have to worry about anything outside, just for that little while. So, although I didn't intend to go in the forest, I made a decision that I was going to stay there for a little while. So, you, why alcohol and drugs? Why did you choose those? Kill the pain. It was pain management, wasn't it? It was uh, self-medication, pain management. Right, yep. So you changed your name to William H. Power. Why was that? Um, I really don't. It was you, just you didn't a, like your second name, I, did you? I, I did. Well, my, look, my name's Gregory Peel. And for those of you that come from Tamworth, you understand what that means. Yeah? My, my ancestors, William Peel, um, and it goes on and on. You know, and um, we, we were named, the Peel comes from um, a British Prime Minister a long time ago. I couldn't stand the name. I was teased in school, you know, apple peel, orange peel, peel me a banana, all the rest of it. Yeah. But I didn't, again, no one took the time out to tell me what my, ma what my name meant. Nobody took the time to explain my ancestors. You know, I walked around most of my life with what I felt was no roots. I had nothing to, to hold on to. I had, you know, uh, I had nothing that I could say, this is me. This is who I am. So if I can't say this is who I am, then I'm nothing. And that's the way I felt. So ten years in the forest, drugs, snakes, whatever you could put your hand on, and you were in a pretty bad way. Aliens. Aliens, you were hearing things in a really dark state. However, what were your ancestors, your aliens, telling you? Um, yeah, I was in there for probably maybe eight years. Um, and I was sitting, you know, I was one night at the campfire and all these entities turned up. And there were voices in my head for, for a few years before that. And there were people telling me that I shouldn't be doing this or I shouldn't be doing that or I should be doing this or I should be doing that. And at the same time, they were showing me ways of living. You know, there was a 
there was this thing inside me that lived inside me that was showing me things that I didn't know. I had no idea. But all of a sudden I could do these things. I knew what I could eat or what I couldn't eat. And there were things that were happening to me. And they were becoming, you know, they were my ancestors. They were, they were becoming quite concerned about me. You know, and then I, after a while I could see them. All these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of faces of people that I knew. And they came in you know, different, different faces, different hairstyles, different dresses, dress styles. Um, and I, I just knew who they were. And they told you, it's time, Gregory. In other words, you decided to give society another chance. So before leaving your campsite, what did you do? Well, I had to do... Well, I lost an argument, is the bottom line. And um, the conditions of losing that argument was that I had to give society another go. I didn't do it by choice. I don't do... In those days, I did nothing by choice. You know, but... Um, I lost an argument and as a result of that, I had to leave the forest and give society another chance. So I started to pack everything up. It was really important to me that I didn't leave a footprint of any kind. But that's what, I, that's what I'd learnt in the forest. I'd learnt to move through the forest without scarring the forest without taking anything I didn't need. And I learned that the forest is a part of me. And if I look after the forest, the forest looks after me. So and that was really important. So you limped out of the forest carrying your didgeridoo, didgeridoo and your dilly bag. What was the significance of your dilly bag? Um, yeah. Well, I carried everything that was important to me in that little dilly bag, um, a candle, so uh, there was always light, box of matches, so I always had fire, a feather to always remind me that there is a freedom somewhere, hope. Uh, um, today my belt dilly bag has a few more things in it. It has a, uh, a little spirit level that reminds me that I have to stay on the level. Uh, um, a deck of cards, you know, cards are really important, they're very symbolic. Symbolism is very powerful, it's a very powerful place to be. Um, a pencil, pencil, and I carry a pencil, a pencil is really, really important because a pencil is, is to me is the magic stick. You know, and it's a magic stick because it writes words and words can hurt or words can put an argument. So this was your epiphany. And you are now back in Byron Bay, alone and slumped on a bench. And you decided to make a shopping list and go shopping. Can you remember what was on that list or can I remind you? <laughs> Pretty good idea what was on that list. Um, yeah, that was after um, I'd come out of the forest and uh, what's not in the book, because I didn't know at the time, I mean, I was still trying to work a lot of stuff out, but the ABC did, went and did a lot of research on my history. And what they learned is that as I came out of the forest, the day they, they worked out the day that I came out of the forest. It was the 22nd of November, 1999. And they know that because as I came out of the forest, I was hit by a car. And there were witnesses to that, and the car actually reversed back over me. So, and I, you know, it was a good thing because I ended up in hospital um, because I was very sick. Um, but I couldn't stay in the hospital. My head just couldn't cope with the, you know, the institutional situation anyway. Long story short, um, a couple of um, case workers worked out who I was, put me on a disability support pension because I was supposed to die you know, within about six months, and so it was a short-term investment. Um, 
can I just um, remind you what was on your shopping list? It was a 750 milliliter bottle of Bourbon, a four liter task of Fruity Lexia wine, a packet of drum tobacco, two packets of Tally Ho papers, remember those? A hydroponic bag of marijuana and some cocaine. But you decided, I don't want to fight anymore. I won't fight anymore. So what did you do? Yeah. Um, yeah, I sit on a park bench back at the Tweed Heads Hospital and, you know, I had an epiphany. Um, the result of that epiphany, I made a decision right there on that. I made the decision that I would do whatever I had to do not to be the person that I was sitting there that day. The person that was sitting there that day was the loneliest person in the world that I knew of anyway. Um, so I got up off the park bench and walked away and I left that bag of drugs and alcohol there and I've never had another, I've never had a drink of alcohol, I've never had a cigarette or a drug since that day. So how's that for strength? So, a couple of months on the wagon, how is life still? Yeah, pretty rough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but you saw a counsellor. I don't know what took you there, but you saw a counsellor. And what did he tell, uh, tell yeah, you? That was, that was a, a TAFE, yeah. Um, yeah, look, at that time, not many people understood where I was at. So how did you appear to people when they looked at you? Um, I, well, I, I learned the nickname of Charles Manson. Um, I was angry, I was um, well, going through withdrawals, tobacco withdrawals, alcohol withdrawals. I had no living skills. I, I had nothing. Um, I got to a point where I would try and conjure what I thought a good night would be. You know, a, a good person. What would a good person do? And so, and I tried, because I was too scared to talk to people. So, and then if I did try to talk to someone and they rejected me, I'd just get angry. You know, I had no, I didn't have a lot of control over my emotions. So there were a lot of things I had to learn. Um, what I did learn was that in the institutions as a child, they never taught me how to communicate. They taught me how to march, how to, be, how to clean grease traps, scrub ablutions, but they never taught me how to talk to other people. So you were in Kingscliff, you decided to go to TAFE and took on a course and you asked how much, but it was free. What was this course and what you, did you decide at the end of it? Yeah, uh, that was Kingscliff TAFE. Uh, I was still homeless. And um, there was a... I'd applied for a lot of jobs and I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a Guernsey anywhere. Um, and so I decided that I would take on this six-week computer hardware TAFE course, free. Um, How was the course? Well, two weeks in, I decided I didn't like computers. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I also made a decision that no matter what happens, I'd be there at the end. And so that's something you kept in the back of your mind. Let's, that, yeah. that, that was a big achievement. Massive. So keep that in mind for the rest of your lives, people. However... You developed a management strategy. There were four points. One was get sober. And the second one is sing Humpty Dumpty. What was the significance of sing Humpty Dumpty? A mantra, a mantra. Um, what was happening is this. This kept interfering with me. This had control of me. This had to stop. This was negative, this is what disrupted me, this is what always beat me in the end. 
what was going on in here. I had to stop it. I had to stop it some way. I didn't know any way. So what I decided to do was every time this started to get the better of me, I would sing Humpty Dumpty. And then I would go through Humpty Dumpty over and over and over again until this stopped. It took a long time and I got bored with Humpty Dumpty so I started on Ringa Ringa Rosie. But I learned a lot about Humpty Dumpty. I learned who Humpty Dumpty was and why all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Yeah? Because we signed the Magna Carta rule of law. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of stuff. And the third thing was be the best person I can and be the, there in the end no matter what. So you had an educational assessment from Yawara, the boy, home for boys. What did they say about you? Yeah, um, look I was diagnosed as a sociopath at the age of 17. Um, and a part of that assessment was that yeah, um, they considered that I was on the bottom edge of dull in my intellectual ability. Um, that, and you know, I mean, my educational capabilities were that I'd, I had a reading uh, capacity of about a, a year eight. My mathematics, I think, were about a year six. So. Uh, in terms of educa you know, education ability, I was very, very low on the scale at that age. So we'll move on a bit. And what was going to be your freedom? What did you aim to do to get that? Yeah. And I'm of this mind today. In fact, I've never heard a good argument that lessens my idea that education is the best way to find a freedom however you see that education to be. And there's lots of different types of education. And I think it was at university, there was a lady called Karen, or a fellow student called Karen, who asked you to have a cup of coffee. What was your reaction to this? Oh, shit. <laughs> I'd never had a cup of coffee with someone before. You know, and... Um, but this was a time of change. Uh, and... You know, there was some momentum happening in my life. And so rather than do the same as that I would always do and say no, um, I accepted that offer. And I was faced with the inevitable questions, you know, where do you live? Oh, yeah, I've got a nice little spot down, down by the beach at, uh, you know. It was nowhere. Yeah, it was in the sand dunes. It was just a little pile with my clothes. And I was still homeless. So sometime later, you were sitting on a park bench on Chevron Island in tears because you didn't know how to get somewhere to live. And this lady came along. Yeah, I decided that I'd like to try and find somewhere to live. And so I went and I sent a TAFE counsellor and she had no idea what I was saying. She had absolutely no idea of what I was trying to say. Because she told me that I needed to go and talk to a real estate or I needed to look in the paper under um, for rent. I said, you got no idea. And one Saturday morning I'm sitting on the Chevron Island and you know, just, it was overwhelming. And I was just sitting there and I was sobbing. And this lady comes up to me and she says, are you okay? And I said, no, for some reason I just, didn't hold back. I just said no and I explained to her why. And she took my hand and she patted the top of my hand. She said, don't worry, sweetheart, we can fix that. And she encouraged me to get up and we walked down to the real estate on Chevron Island. And when she took me through the mechanics of finding somewhere. And... Within a week I was, I was living in a little flat on Chevron Island. So you had a place of your own but you had no furniture. How did you get this furniture? Uh, entrepreneurial. <laughs> um, <laughs> milk crates. Milk crates are great. 
Yeah? You, you're like Lego. You know, bigger Lego. So, look, I had um, had milk crates to sit on, and um, what I did was to sleep on because I did. You know, I was changing. This has changed, and I didn't want to sleep on the f on the ground anymore. I mean, I didn't have anything, but I didn't want to sleep on the ground. So I got a whole lot of milk crates and unscrewed the door off the bathroom and put it on the milk crates, and that was my bed. And so I slept on that for a few nights, and uh, that was a bit hard. Um, I ended up going to uh, to. Uh, a donation, an op shop and getting a few things. But the other thing I did, I missed a fire. I missed my fire. So I went and, you know, I felt really bad about it, but I nicked a hubcap off an old Volkswagen, you know, the old steel ones, and I took it back and collected the twigs and each night I'd have my little fire in the, in the flat. So you were thinking about education and you thought you'd do your school certificate, but you were encouraged to apply for the preparation for university course. And you did this, and the result was what? This was the most amazing result. Um, Don't yeah, be bashful. Yeah, I did pretty good. Um. He got three high, three high distinctions and a special achievement award. But you still had self-doubts. What would people really think if they found out who you really were? Yeah, that's true. Because um, I still knew who I was. And um, one of the things about living, me living with me, is that no matter how much I, I try to change, I don't always see it. You know, it's not always... Evident. It's not as if, you know, I have a friend and I don't see them for a few days or a few weeks and then they come back and I say, oh, you've got a little bit of change, that's really good. You don't see that in yourself. Yeah, so it's, it's so nuanced that, um, you know, I, don't, I never knew. So to me, I was still the same person. So you went to university at the Tweed Head campus of Southern Cross University. And your first lecture, you were doing social sciences. Can you remember the start of that first lecture? Uh, yeah, actually, I met that guy. I've uh, seen that guy. Um, Neville, his name was. Neville Jennings. Um, Pro Professor Neville Jennings. I was sitting in the hallway, you know, with a whole lot of other students waiting for, um, waiting for the uh, lecturer to turn up. And uh, we see and this little guy comes stumbling up the stairs. He's got about you know, six pair of glasses, a few pairs of binoculars, a telescope, a couple of magnifying glasses. You know, and he walks into the lecture theatre. Oh, this must be him. OK, so we all go in, take our seats, and he dumps it all down on the, on the floor. And he turns around and he looks at everybody. He says, that's social science. What do you mean? Seeing life through different lenses. What a wonderful yeah. approach. However, moving on to another lecturer, and she asked all the students to think about a happy experience when you were a child. How did you react to that? Yeah, no, I didn't do too good that day. <laughs> no. Um, and there was no preparation, and it just, you know, there was just a spontaneous, and I, it got me, it hit me. Um, and I just jumped up and I said, there's an assumption in that, you know, and that assumption is that every child, everybody has a happy childhood, you know, and that's just not true. And I walked out, I stomped out. But you were met by another lecturer, Trevor, and he picked up the pieces, so to speak. Yeah, um, as I walked out and I, I, you know, I, it was evident that I wasn't happy. People usually know when I'm not happy, even today. But uh, it was evident that I wasn't happy and uh, he just happened to be walking past and um, picked up on it. And to his credit... Um, you know, he took some time out, we had a conversation, 
He asked me what I was doing. I said, I've got no idea, mate. I've got absolutely... I, you know, um, I was in university. I hadn't really spoken to anybody. It's intimidating. The whole process... I was first in family, first in, you know, in my world. Um, and it was a big thing. I had no idea. He took the time out uh, to help me. Um, and we put a plan together. The interesting thing about Trevor... His unit was the only unit that I got a pass in. Every other unit, I got a D or better. I got a distinction or better. His, I only ever got a pass. And I think that was just to keep me feet on the ground. <laughs> I actually appreciated it. So you achieved your bachelor degree... And then it was suggested you go and co uh, complete your thesis for first class honours. And what was your top topic? Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, I hadn't quite finished my degree when I was approached by um, the university to do some work. Uh, and as I've learned in life, there's always conditions you know, to, to these things, and the condition was that I go on and do further study. Um, and that further study was an honours. I couldn't work out what I was going to um, write it on. So I, after some conversations with uh, another, oh, uh, Richard Hill, Professor Richard Hill, a very close friend of mine today, um, he said to me, why don't you do it on yourself? No, not likely. But what we compromised on was that I would do it on um, some people that were now adults that had experienced time in, Armada in the Armadale orphanage. So I vicariously told my story through them. So It was, it was called... The, the thesis title was called, I'd like to tell you a story, but I'm not sure if I can. But you did. Yes. So you are now Gregory Peel Smith, Bachelor of Social Sciences, Honours First Class. How are you feeling now? I was a little bit worried at the time, because it, although when it came back and I had a first class thesis, um, my supervisors were saying things like, um, you could do a PhD. And I didn't even know what a PhD was. Um, and then they were saying things like, you've won a scholarship. Um, you know, and so they were encouraging me to, to take this on and they were offering me a whole lot more work. Uh, life was getting pretty busy. I was getting offers for good, for good work. Um, I was all of a sudden doing a, an associate lecturer. Um, you know, I was, I was coming up in the world. I mean, I would have been happy on a prawn trawler if it had meant work. You know, but all of a sudden I find myself in a, you know, in, in a respected, a fully, a full on respected position. And I'm thinking, you know, I've got, I'm teaching students and they're asking me questions. And I'm thinking, wow, this is different. So your PhD, your Doctorate of Philosophy, you achieved in 2011. And there was a parade through the streets of Lismore of students graduating and a headline in the papers said something about uh, they wanted to interview this person because he'd been a homeless man. He had a PhD. Then later on you met your... Si I'm jumping because we've got to keep it in time. You met your sisters at Woolai. Can you remember that occasion? Uh, yeah. Look, one of my objectives, I mean, all my life, from the time I was in the orphanage, one of my objectives was to get my family back together. I always wanted my family back together. So, um, one of my sisters I sort of had contact with, but... One of the benefits of um, doing an honours and 
uh, undergrad and things like that is you learn to research. So, you know, I had the, I had all these skills that I developed. And I was able to find my sisters and reunite with my sisters. Um, yeah, it was I was um, just very quickly. One of my sisters, I put the word out, um, and I was volunteering in a soup kitchen in uh, on the Gold Coast Christmas Day. And I had this really magic device, a mobile phone, you know, it was like cool. Uh, and it rang, and nobody ever rang me, but it rang this day and it was one of my sisters. And she said to me, I hear you, be, I hear you haven't had a drink for four years. And I said, yes, that's right. She said, can you help me? I said, yeah, I can. So it took a little while, but uh, I, after a while I went and met her. Uh, she hasn't had a drink now for about, I think, 16, 17 years. And your sister Leanne, was that Leanne? No, that, was, that, was, that was Wendy. Right, but Leanne at this meeting, she wrote on a card to Gregory, I have watched you walk along the track and seen it turn into a trail and now a highway. What a life. So today, while Gregory lectures, he's researching, he serves on the board of Anglicare North Coast on Relationships Australia, is a founding member of Voice Up Australia, a group that provides social and advocacy platform for adult survivors of childhood violence. Gregory displays a life of change, of overcoming generational self-perpetration, that his father, a violent alcoholic who abused his family, and Gregory who didn't get much schooling. What is it that some people can break the mould and overcome extraordinary circumstances? What makes some people able to do this and some not? What makes some people extraordinary? One extraordinary person, Dr Gregory Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Gregory is happy to take a few questions if you have one. Need to have a little time to think perhaps. But you are an extraordinary person. Have, have Loudly please. Have you connected with your sister permanently and got back together? Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, Trauma creates strange lives. Trauma creates strange minds. Three of my sisters I, re I united with very strongly. One passed um, early last year. Um, I miss her very much. Two of my sisters... Um, uh, live in so much trauma that they are still angry, still very bitter uh, about their life. But the other two sisters I'm very close to and we have a very, very strong bond and understanding today. And Gregory, thank you for sharing your life with us. I think most of us are nearly in tears. And this is just a small token to say thank you.